Hi lovelies, welcome back to the channel. Today is a really special video. It's, kind of, it's a different video, we haven't done anything like this before. We are gonna be answering your relationship questions as submitted on my Instagram. Yeah, I think we're a lot more confident with it because we've been doing daily vlogs and stuff. I feel a lot more open with you guys and I feel I can tell you a lot more now. So we're gonna do a couple of questions by ourselves so you yeah. really get just that one person's take. Just the wife, just the husband, and then we'll come together at the end and we'll answer some questions together. Yeah, if you are over 18, oh sorry, under 18, then please do <laughs> seek permission from your parents before you watch any You're further. making us, it's like no, so why X-rated. Some people feel like, oh, my daughter's watching it and I feel like that conversation wasn't appropriate. You know, then it's, it's not. Why, what you gonna talk about? I don't know, there's certain things I think I should touch up on. Any disclaimers? Well, we'll see it. You have to watch the video. Oh, right. That was a disclaimer. Sorry, I thought... Okay. No, no. Oh, the disclaimer is... Look, our advice is based on what happened with us and what we feel is the right thing to do. There's no right or wrong answer. You might have something completely different, which would be appreciated if you comment underneath and tell us what your opinion on that is. Don't go out and lash out at your wife or husband because we said this. <laughs> okay? It's not the way to do it. You take baby steps. You take it slowly. Whatever we advise you, or what we think is right, take it slowly. Don't jump into it. With that being said, let's get started. Question number one is from who ish Hannah. How do you prevent your spouse from getting bored of you? Wait, why would your spouse get bored of you and why would you be worried about them getting bored of you? I'm gonna step in right now and say, hey, don't say that to your spouse. That's not a nice thing to say. Here's the thing, if you're concerned about your spouse getting bored of you or you getting bored of your spouse, you really need to address that in that if it's a case of you not being able to fully be yourself in a relationship because you're paranoid that your spouse is gonna get bored of you, then you really ought to work on yourself and understand that marriage is a safe space. It's a space where you can fully be yourself and your partner should fully be themselves and you should be able to accept and love each other for who, who you are. If your spouse is like saying to you that they're getting bored of you, well, you have to kind of weigh that up because on the one hand, look, manipulative, narcissistic people exist who will try and control you and get you to be who they want you to be and they want you to fully devote yourself to them and nobody else, they don't want you to have any friends and they will say anything to get their way. So they might be saying, hey, I'm getting bored of you. The other side of that is, if you're talking about getting bored as in you're losing the passion from your relationship, then that's definitely something that both of you should address. So it might be a case of you, you know, reigniting that passion in your marriage either by doing social activities so you might go out and do more things together part try and partake in each other's hobbies to show that you care about the other person even if you might not fully be into the type of stuff they're in i mean that's what you do for the person you love it might be a sense of reigniting passion in the bedroom because like sexual chemistry is really 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 important like let's not put that on the back burner ladies that is like it's very important and there's a misconception that it's something that you know women aren't bothered about or that they don't care about women are just as much or not as interested in the sexual part of a relationship as men so that kind of that chemistry and that compatibility is really really important and i would say that that is one of the central parts of a marriage so it's definitely worth addressing if you're throwing words at each other saying i'm getting bored of you that's like definitely that needs looking at or you need to get counseling Okay, getting bored is a very strong word. If someone, if your partner is getting bored of you, then you need to address it in many ways. For me, for example, um, we, we don't get bored with each other because I think we give each other space uh, in terms of, like I get to do football, I get to go out with my friends, we get to do things together, go as a family for a meal, or go to the cinemas, or go travel somewhere, go sightseeing. There are things that you need to do together to not get bored of each other. So it's not just um, doing things outside, but also in the bedroom as well. I know this sounds explicit, but you have to please each other both ways, not one way only. That way you're not going to get bored of each other. It's not just external activities you do, but also physical ones. 
I'm sorry it sounds explicit, but I think it has to be said and these conversations need to happen because I think in our community we kind of suppress it or don't talk about it and it's important that we do and I'm assuming everyone watching this are over 18 and <laughs> mature enough to handle these conversations and listen to them. We personally do things together outside activities like sports <laughs> and um, you know I, I let her just go and do whatever she wants sometimes and same vice versa like we're not too strict with each other in terms of you can't do this and you can't do that as long as you're behaving yourself and I think you build trust that way as well next question your local T-Rex non-muslim who's been a long time viewer here even though you have arguments like you say in this post you and your husband seem perfect for each other I remember from a previous Q&A that you said that the two of you met on a social media website called High Five and within a few months you had met each other's parents and gotten married. That's not exactly the Western way of getting married, but it's not entirely the traditional Islamic way either. From what I understand, it was Osama who took the initiative, sought you out on High Five and asked you out for lack of a better term. My question is, do you think you still would have found your perfect match, your soulmate, Osama, if you had gone the traditional Islamic route and had your parents pick potential suitors for you? Wow, that is a great question. You remember a lot. So everything you said was absolutely right. That is what happened. Your question is a very metaphysical question. It's hitting me right in the, in the spiritual feels. So you're really talking about the idea of soulmates. And the way that I feel about it, I'm just gonna literally, I'm just gonna tell you my feelings, okay? All logic and everything aside in terms of like the, <laughs> the likelihood of my parents having somehow <laughs> sourced Hobbsy. Um, let's put logistics and all of that aside. I'm gonna just tell you my feelings, which is that to me, soulmates were created in pairs before our souls descended onto this earth. So my soul has known Osama's soul from before our souls inhabited these bodies. So I believe that we were a match made in a different place in a different time and that our souls knew each other before we occupied this earth. And so I believe that God, why is my heart racing? I'm feeling really emotional. So I feel like when we encountered each other, there was a sense of familiarity that we had with each other because even though our physical bodies hadn't met before, I feel like our souls had. And so, yes, I believe that whatever route we had taken in finding each other, we would have ended up together either way. And we've been like, through the years we've compared notes and there's been times where like he's been at the same place that I've been at around the same time, but we just never happened to bump into each other. Um, so yes, the answer to the question is I fully, totally, 100% without any reservations believe that we were meant for each other and we were going to find each other whatever life had laid in front of us. That's all I can say on that. Shall we move on? Yeah. Maybe tea break time? Is it tea break? Yeah. Why do I feel all like emosh about that know. question? I don't know. It's like when I talk to the kids about soulmates and like how we were a family voice. Yeah, it's hitting that, that hitting deep that deep stuff. part. And it's taking me back to that. Well, it's, it's making me like assess my whole life, right? And yeah. like all the and downs the and then ups. And how it was made. Yeah. And, and like just how, like I dreamed of finding a soulmate. Okay, the arranged marriage route is a traditional way, right? In the South Asian culture. And let's get that right first and the second thing is that it does work for people it's not for everybody does it work in this day and age yes it does um, I know many people that are arranged marriage and they're perfectly fine I mean they do get to learn about each other at that point you must remember a lot of people that arrange marriage they're already geared to mentally to go along that route throughout their lives because their family's been through it and if you're if it's not for you then don't do it, right? That's what I say. Um, only go arrange marriage if you are happy to accept that method. You shouldn't be forced into 
being arranged marriage anyway that's an islamic because going against your wishes is where it becomes a problem for me at least and also for the person in question because it can have psychological effects you can't arrange marriage and then force them into it right if you're arranged and you're happy to be with the person you are being arranged with i think that can positively go well for you um but not if you're being forced into that relationship does that make sense and then that person can become your soulmate to be honest my mom was never looking for a arranged marriage whereas her mom was she was always looking for someone for the daughters and so i was happy at the fact that my mom was happy for me to pick whoever i wanted now is it because i'm a boy and she's a girl i don't know um uh, i think with my sister she was my mom was happy for her to pick as well uh although she did get arranged marriage technically speaking and but my sister was given a choice to say yes or no when she was given those choices and she just chose to go ahead with it and she's happy alhamdulillah so it worked for her um would it be something i would have gone ahead with no probably i wouldn't go for I would never have gone for arranged marriage because I feel that's not my personal choice that's my parents choice and that's what they look for in a person not what I look for in a person and I look for totally completely different things to what they look for and I think I've chosen the perfect woman for what I feel is right for me she's beautiful she's caring she's a boss woman and an amazing person to be with all together oh you're going to get Oh you're going to get points for Pese. that. Yeah, you're going to get Pese points. Pay the dedo. Ten pounds, you're cheap. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next question. Fiona Elizabeth thus. When an argument happens, what exact steps do you take to move past it slash get closure? Do you prefer to speak quickly to reach resolution or offer space to each other to reflect and come back with perspective? Meaning those times when it goes right, as we all know it doesn't always go right. Lots of love to you and yours. Always enjoy your videos. Oh, Okay. What exact steps do we take? Okay. I'm going to tell you after 12 Has it been 12, babe? 12 or 13? Oh my god, I'm so bad with numbers. 13. Sorry. Bad wife. After 13 years of marriage, I can conclude that the way that we handle things, this is our way of handling things. We express how we feel and then we give each other space. and then we come like we regroup we give each other space to reflect on what's been said the reason being is we both process information very very differently so in the heat of a moment we know that we're not going to be able to communicate in the best way possible we'll communicate words will be there but in terms of understanding each other that can take some time so we give each other space and then we come back we regroup and that that works so well for us now. Now the reason that I kind of got caught up in my words in the beginning is cuz I was kind of rewinding in my head to how we used to deal with stuff like before these 13 years had passed. And in the beginning it was totally different. So my way of dealing with things back then was to like just get it all dealt with in one session. So let's just have it out. Let's just have this conversation. You know, this is what's happened and let's deal with this then and there and I would like demand that he be present in that and that we deal with it right then and there in the moment. We don't do that anymore. That doesn't work because we realize that we're completely different people in how we understand and process information. So it's better for us now that we communicate in a healthy way and that means we sit together and the way that we do it is so we have to like we don't engage in name calling um we don't engage in like i don't know whatever like swearing or like you know chucking things and like violence and that kind of thing um it's i feel that that is just so incredibly destructive and even though you know you live and you forgive and forget and all that kind of thing we have to be so careful with what we say like our tongues are going to <laughs> really either make or break our relationship or our words even um despite what we're thinking in here like 
that's why it's so important to keep your head space clear and so that's why I feel like space is sometimes needed to just work through what's happening in our heads because it's not just two people that are present in an argument you know even if there's just the two of you present in the room the other entity that's present is your inner child so there's me I'm another adult hey doing the adult thing and there's obviously the adult doing the adult thing and then there's our inner children. So there's little Amina who's going to be responding to really what's not happening in the moment, but responding to the past and what she's been through in the past. And same with him. So in order for us to kind of consolidate everything that we know, everything that we're made up of, with that space as needed. Now we work from a place of not making the other person feel like they're being attacked. And both of us are very sensitive to that. So we're very sensitive to it where it comes to people that we're close to. So there's a difference there. And that is a completely normal, natural human thing, right? Because the people that are close to you can have the ability to hurt you the most as well. So we have to tread really carefully and not making the other person feel attacked. So we work from a place that this is the structure. Thank you, darling. Thank you very much. So we work from a place of, um, so, um, articulating our feelings first so this is the structure so i feel hurt when x y and z okay or i feel for example i feel hurt when you say that you're going to do something and you don't i really feel like i'm being disrespected and that way the other person knows that they're not like some monster hurting the other person it's a normal natural human thing to do to misunderstand each other but so that we can be conscious of how the other person's feeling as a result of our behavior, the best thing is for that other person to literally say what their feelings are. And so we have to be to a degree, that's why I always say, like I'm always saying on the social media, we have to know ourselves. And we have to dig deep and understand ourselves. Your phobia on socks. My sock story. You might as well just say that. Your phobia on socks. Should I? Yeah. Okay. So look, socks are a thing for me, guys. Loads of you asked me, I'm just gonna just gonna do this part. Um, I've had many jobs in the past before um, doing what I do before being an entrepreneur, before being an influencer, before having my businesses. I've worked in lots of retail, corporate, um, and one of the jobs that I had when I was 15 or 16, well no, 16 because that's legal age, yes, 16, um, was that I worked in a shoe shop. And in that shoe shop, the policy was that we had to hands-on, physically hands-on deal with every customer in that we were to hand them their shoes, handle their socks, uh, help them put the new sh shoes on and that kind of thing and so I got put in the men's department I really wanted to be in children's but no no men's it was and so I used to deal with it's just so going to be like look if you have a sock phobia or anything any kind of disgust associated with smelly feet then you know mute me right now but oh it's because it's so TMI you know that disgusting <laughs> indescribably awful cheesy sock smell i don't know it now thank god like god has blessed me with like non-smelly people around me but back then i used to have customers who had the smelliest stinkiest feet and i used to have to deal with their shoes and then you know they'd have to like oh my god like i'd have to deal with the smelly socks you breathe? and it was like i mean what do you do back then like i was a total people pleaser totally petrified that i would get fired if i raised any kind of complaint it's like really scared to, to not have that income. And so I kind of just put up with it and tried to just be smiley and cheery. Um, ideal customer sales assistant, but like on a personal level, that really traumatized me. I cannot even explain to you because, you know, you can't get out of that situation. God, I'm getting flashbacks as we speak. Um, yeah, so I have a, like total like socks. I just don't like to see socks in like nice spaces, like a space where I want to relax and feel comfortable and feel good in my skin and that kind of thing. Like in the shoes, in the hallway, I'm totally fine with that. Even like kids having them in their rooms, that's fine. But in my like sacred space, I don't like there to be dirty socks. If they're clean socks, I actually don't mind. But yeah, it's a dirty sock element that just gets to me, takes me back there, makes me literally want to vomit. That's that's what it is. Hubs has been great with it. In the beginning, not so much. He really didn't understand it. And I think there's a question on emotional intelligence, so we'll come back to that later. In the, in the beginning, he really didn't understand. Um, and he's been really good. And like the other day, he just slipped and it just happened. And I think I was already like on edge because I could just see them and I was waiting for him to pick it up. Um, and then eventually I was just like, oh, you know how I feel about socks. Yeah. The steps that we take 
to get closure on arguments is firstly address the issue address the issue talk about it don't like it can't be a one way thing where one person's talking and the other one's not responding right you have to give your two pence even if it's wrong and then after you've heard what they say uh, in our, my opinion after I've heard what she says um, I will go reflect if I genuinely feel that I've wrong myself then I'll come back and apologise saying you know what I thought about it I did wrong x y and z and I think moving forward we can rectify it by doing x y and z so you have a problem and you have to have a solution otherwise you're just going to keep on going it might not be wrong in your world but it is wrong in the uh, your partner's world right and in her lifestyle so you have to adjust yourself accordingly if it's not making her happy then you adjust yourself that's my take on it okay it's like for example the other day when she came out from outside and um, her and her sister were talking about some guys were being overtly friendly with her maybe she didn't have a ring on or maybe she looks younger than she does and I was like asking her like okay what who was it who was it what was it what did they say <laughs> tell me the name describe them you know I just asked so many questions right and she wouldn't answer the question and that frustrated me because you know like I like to know these things just in case something happens in the future that I know like who to deal with or what to deal with and you make it in the future babe no it's not like you have an affair but someone trying to um, hit on you and that makes me uncomfortable yeah I'll murder him <laughs> yeah I'll kill him also um, I think the other one is like when we watch a movie when you're watching an Indian movie and then she talks over like an Indian movie what is this does it even make sense you know <laughs> look they're gonna do this and it's gonna be finished such a cliche you know like She'll over idolize the movie before it's even over, be, rather than just watching it and just, you know, like when you watch an Indian movie, although it's predictable sometimes, you, you just watch it anyway, right? But with her, it's like, you know, I think that's just frustrating. But anyway, that's my thing. And you don't do that when I'm watching a Leonardo DiCaprio movie? No, I've never done that. I just watch you it. You start teasing me. That's teasing. That's different, okay? Because she looks at him too carefully. <laughs> Why don't you do your hair like this? No, no I don't. Yeah, you did I used to. I never said that. Grow your hair like this. <laughs> huh? So let's do the next question, which is NXLFVA. Yeah. Oh, Neelofa. Individually, how did you two know you were ready for the commitments that marriage entails? Does the thought of being with one person forever and the responsibility of taking care of each other and their expectations not scare you? So basically, it's about... Um, how did you know you were ready for the commitment and didn't it scare you that it's like one person forever? I think for me it was always the case that I wanted to be married uh, rather than just date around and you know and then get married when the golden woman comes later on um, so for me it was always expected to just commit to one and that's it I think it was the same for you I believe right and that's why I, when I saw her thought yeah I'm gonna marry her um, what do you think um, I was not scared of committing to one person in fact I felt like when I met him I'd been searching for far too many years I mean from the age of like I want to say nine or ten which which is a real eye-opener when I consider lovebug being ten yeah. I was looking for my perfect love which is really bizarre. We used to watch a lot of Bollywood movies back then. And Friends. <laughs> what, Friends? Yeah. What, the TV show? Yeah. Not when I was 10. I was like secondary school. Oh. Obviously that got um, amplified through the years watching Dawson's Creek, watching this movie, Leonardo DiCaprio, a bit of Titanic, a bit of this, a bit of that, a bit of Romeo and Juliet and kind of thing. So it got I amplified. Know, yeah. But I honestly yeah. felt like I'd been searching for my true love forever. And cool. I feel sad. For myself that I felt that way oh, okay. because I sh that's far too young of an age to have been searching for that kind of love and I now realize that I've been searching for an external love because of what I was lacking on the inside so my love story starts way back because essentially it was a love story where I really needed to find myself just to answer your question oh hell no like I wasn't scared at all I was like yes 
I've done it. Like I found my one true love, which is great. Don't regret it. I think that we didn't meet at the right time. Yeah. Um, because I'd had this, this so many, I felt like I'd been waiting for so long, even though like twenties, like I was you were early twenties. Oh my gosh. Like that's young. That's like babies are so, so young to get married. 21 and I 22. Think. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it is so, considered young. And when I look back at it, I do look young, very young. But I'd be like 22 And when I compare it to other 21 year olds right now, I think, oh, you're too baby. young to get married. And they look like babies. I was talking to a girl the other and day, she's like 26. I'm like, you're a baby, honey. Don't worry about getting married. Yeah. Like in the Asian culture, it's like you, tur- you turn 30 and you're like, you've expired. Put you on that shelf of women who will never get married. It's not the same for men, blatantly. Yeah. But like, I was, I was even, speaking, even speaking to like a 32 year old. I was like, honey, you're fine. You're completely fine. Don't worry about it. You're only just coming into your own. But yeah, that's a different... That's a different topic. But I do feel in the Asian community a lot of uh, men get married a lot quicker. You think so? Yeah. I mean, well, you did. By twenty, between twenty five and twenty eight. But is the pressure more. the same? It's not the same. No. Hell no. Okay. I don't know what it's like in the UK, but I know in in the Indian subcontinent it is like that. I would say so. You know that movie um, with Drew Barrymore where she goes back to school? Yeah. And she pretends to be. A teacher or something. Ah, oh, what's it called? Never been kissed. That's it. Yeah. You know how they talk about the penguins that are like looking for their other half. Is it the penguins? I don't know. Maybe I'm messing up. Or friends, the crabs thing, right? Okay. The, the one made for each other. Like that was my thought on like the whole marriage thing, and I was totally ready for it. I was like, yes, monogamy, one true love. Never went out with anyone. Then I saw you. Ah, oh, bless. And vice versa. You've never dated anyone. He's now going to reveal actually why I see. Scroll. Actually. <laughs> Quintra Aisha. How important is emotional intelligence in a partner? So emotional intelligence is... So if you take intelligence, it's like how well somebody understands something, right? So you think, okay, that person's intelligent because they understand things. They can comprehend what they're observing. Emotional intelligence is when someone has the intelligence and ability to grasp another person's emotions and also their own. Yeah. More so their own. Yeah. So it's to really understand your own emotions. If you don't, you might be barking up the wrong tree, if that makes sense. Um, you won't know how to communicate the right information if you don't know what emotional emotions your partner is in or they could be having a bad day and you're treating that as something wrong that they're doing when it's everything has a everything has a reason right every issue or pain or grief has reason it could be psychological issue it could be a problem that someone's having with their friends or the parents or whatever now you need to understand that emotion before you go in with your issue right I I personally Mm. think that Mm. Um, and I feel like when we first got married we I know that I wasn't emotionally intelligent i barely even understood my own emotions mm-hmm. i literally thought there were two emotions happy and sad yeah maybe angry there's a whole spectrum yeah. so i didn't understand that there could be in between i also didn't understand that emotions are not permanent states so it's not doom and gloom end of the world when you get feel like feel like you're stuck in an emotion and um, but yeah we didn't really have emotional intelligence I mean, we were babies it, i we mean were this is babies. i know this is about uh, in a relationship, right? But how many of you in a real life situation look at a person, usually they're normal, but once they, you know, go a bit off uh, compared to usual, do you give them an excuse to think, okay, maybe they're having a bad day at home, maybe they're having issues in the personal life, maybe they're having health issues? We never really question those things because we go on the defense and going to attack mode first girls tend to be a lot more in generally speaking okay girls tend to be a lot more advanced in their emotional intelligence and um general emotional maturity than the boys i mean you know i know of i've come across many many men who are like in their 30s mid to late 30s because they're still living at home don't know how to do the laundry don't know how to take care of themselves don't know about a woman's body, like have no clue whatsoever because it's like la da floating through life. The expectations weren't put on them. Certainly within our culture, the Desi culture requires so much of women for us to understand so much. We have to judge things. Like we're told like, oh, you know, be 
careful of this and that and you know be conscious of your father's this and that and your whoever if you've got brothers or be careful of society and all that i'm not saying the boys don't get it too but the girls get it on a different level and because we we mature differently on a social level there can be this this mismatch and this unbalanced sense of emotional intelligence so that you got to have that looked at because Emotional intelligence will make or break a relationship. It is so important. I believe that if that part of us individually and both together in this marriage had not developed, then we could not have stayed together. Mm-hmm. We had to. It was like, suck it up, learn how to do it right. You know, if you're old enough and you're mature enough and you have taken on the responsibility for marriage, you better take that seriously. You better commit your time, your effort, your energy, because it's not a joke. Especially where, I mean, even if actually children aren't in the picture, when you choose to get married, you are responsible for ensuring that that marriage works out. Each of you is responsible for that. You've both signed up for that because it's not just you who's, who's involved. It is two families coming together. Yeah. It is such a massive responsibility and there is dignity required compassion, consideration, course, love and mercy and understanding and playfulness and the time and attention and all of that is so important. And that is not a responsibility that should be taken lightly. Okay. I'm sorry. I have to say it from like a female perspective in terms of the things that I read and I hear about, we have a lot of women who go in and, you know, they might already go in with like a self-esteem crisis and the expectations put on the man is to, is to really fill that void that the woman has within herself. That's your responsibility to work on you, okay, as a, as a woman. Flipped around, it's a man's responsibility to ensure that he is doing his best to understand his partner, to make her feel loved and special and to go in and commit 100%. If you're married, it is not the time to be out, you know, prancing about with your mates while she's at home looking after the kids. It is like, pull it together, dude. This is like a serious responsibility. Your kids are going to be fully shaped by who you are and how you treat your wife and how you treat your kids. And especially if you have young girls in the house and young boys, you are playing such a crucial part. And if you are a grown ass person who's old enough, to be putting your DNA out there into the world and having kids, you better suck it up and do your best to be the best father that you can be to help that child to be in an environment where they feel safe and loved and taken care of and not feel like they're ignored and abused. And that actually also goes for the the women too. I'm just talking about, look, I'm just reflecting on a lot of the stuff that I hear from women. Obviously it's gonna be biased because I'm a woman, but yeah no i agree that that happens a lot is because the male thinks that it's a woman's job to look after the baby and it's not it's it's a it's a dual responsibility for the male and female yes you can have your time to do things but if you're doing it every day then there's something wrong right if you if you're like I got a good end, guys. Got a good egg. <laughs> got a good egg here. <laughs> I think you have to draw a balance. Like, and I, we understand as males that we need our alone time or we need our entertainment time and this and the other. Do it. However, make sure your wife is okay. Make sure she's got support while you're gone, or make sure you've got everything in place for her that she doesn't, you know, feel a complete wreck uh, while you're gone. Right. I remember when I used to go football back in the day when the kids were younger, mm-hmm. I used to call your sister over, right? Mm-hmm. Just to make sure that, you know, there's um, someone there while I'm not there. Um, there's been times when I've, been, I've not been there when she's by herself and she struggled as well. And, and you know, I'm sorry for that. I, I think that was a learning curve for That's me. That's all right, babe. That was a long time ago. <laughs> no, but it's a learning curve. You learn from it, obviously. But you don't get taught these things from people. People will only um, try and give you a negative response, right? Um, always take the positive response. That is always the right way to go. Something that sounds right. And both of you are equally responsible for the upbringing of the children. Even if one of you is with the children physically more than the other due to work commitments, yeah. in terms of responsibility, equal. Okay. Yeah. And that's not just because I'm like, yeah, women's rights, you know, equal, da, da, da. I'm talking about children, okay? 
the state of the world will depend upon how we parent our children how well we take care of our children because those same children are going to grow into adults and they will be shaped by their childhoods okay yeah. so whether you look at you want to make politics better or schools or the workplace or whatever better it all starts with within the home oh okay. can i just add to yeah. that actually yeah. um things that you can do to help your partner out in the home i know this doesn't happen that often in the uk but maybe you can get a cleaner maybe you can get uh take your wife to her parents house or your parents house for that period that you're either out or um doing something because she might need the help unless you think she, she oh she says it herself that you know what i'll be fine you go it's only an hour i'll be fine you go it's sounds like something i would say right then then that's different that's between you and your partner but you have to make sure if you don't have that communication between the two of you then she's going to feel upset and then you're going to have to deal with that uh and then the process will get even more difficult so i think that's where emotional intelligence will come right next question yeah let's do the last question yeah. does love exist even after a few years of marriage does the love get affected after kids does um i think love grows after kids personally and i'll tell you why because you together you brought up these two lovely beings of what in our case anyway which both of them have a part of you in them right how can your love not grow knowing that you've created a being together which are such smart beings and amazing creatures maybe if you're feeling that your love isn't there when uh your kids are small because of the hard work that goes when they are younger and uh, but you're building up memories at that point that you will look at them in the future and appreciate them trust me on that and it only gets better as they get older. So how love changes after a marriage. I think it's really important that you set time aside for each other. Yeah. That has to happen. Date nights, whatever nights, make it happen. Get a babysitter. If you absolutely can't get a babysitter, while they're at school, plan an activity. I don't know. Take a day both of you take a day off work that day and do something together. But at least at the very least once a month and we're talking like when everything's really really busy, you have to take time out for yourselves. Oh, Your absolutely. kids have to understand that in mum and dad's life the person that their mum and dad love absolutely the most and the person that is most important to them is each other. Yeah. This relationship and the kids have to be conscious of this is the most important relationship in the household in terms of uh, the priority that is given. Mm. Okay? Kids, you know there's things like where parents argue and fight and then they pull the kids into it. And then you know, mum or dad will take one of the kids to be on their side. Mm -hmm. And it's really obvious who is on whose side and kids get used as like these pawns in this game. And um that's destructive. That's right? like that's so destructive. Um you can become like you can enter these situations where kids become like have this spouse role in the relationship, mm -hmm. like the kid becomes almost like the spouse figure. And that you as parents you have to understand you are so making your child's life so difficult not just then but for the rest of their lives because they will be stuck in that role and they'll be stuck to they you they will go through stress and anxiety dealing with those issues as well children are too young for this yeah. so it's really important that you make it known that you've got mom and dad and mom and dad are there and they are the the sort of the heads of the house so to speak okay mm. not dictators but like they are in charge of it's their rules so there has to be a very clear outline there and as part of that relationship and that commitment to each other mom and dad need their time together too so whether it be evening time or this time or that time mom and dad need that time they need their personal time you know that you ch ch children must be taught at an appropriate age to knock before they come into mom and dad's room they can't just storm in no matter what time of day or night it is also you know? sleeping early as well the reason why you should make it a thing to get your kids to sleep early from a younger age is because by the time they get to 7 8 years old when they start sleeping 7 8 o'clock 9 o'clock wherever it is uh you get that evening free for you to to spend time with each other and relax or talk or watch a movie or you know just do something together yeah cuz you rejig after kids yeah. instead of spending like the whole cuz you're spending your whole just day each either working yeah. or preparing for the kids yeah. or you know running around them yeah. and then you just want that 
end day because if you do it from morning to night 12 you're gonna burn out and that's when problems happen you're gonna burn out you, you're not giving look this is self-care this is where you give your time to yourself in the evenings right and i always say this to wives as well stop what you're doing stop your work you know um just relax now from nine o'clock we're not doing any work we're just going to relax we're going to either watch a movie we're going to watch a show or we're going to talk to each other or we're going to i don't know there's something we do cuddle like, on the sofa cozy yeah, cozy yeah yeah right so that's about it guys those are all the questions thanks so much for watching if you have any follow-up questions or anything else that you want us to do in a part two there isn't a part two as far as i know but if you want there to be comment below click like subscribe and all the rest of that yeah. and we'll see you in our next video thanks so much for all the questions everyone Mwah.